What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Locked On Reds podcast for this Wednesday. I'm your host, Jeff Carr. Thank you so much for watching, for listening, and joining me for some Reds talk. Actually, today we're going to add in a little bit. We're going to add some Dragons talk to the mix. I have Jeff Gilbert from the Dayton Daily News joining me to give an update on what the Dragons have been doing to this point in the season. We're going to look at Jesse Winker and Nick Castellanos as we reset them after the All-Star game. And we've got a detractor in the comments section to respond to. We're going to get to all of that here in just a minute. But before we do, let's play the intro graphic. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. How's it going, everybody? We are past the All-Star game. We are looking toward the two days of a break, really, for Jesse Winker and Nick Castellanos. The rest of the players have had a couple more days than that, and we are getting set for the next Brewers series in case you uh, need to reset your pacemakers, get that ready. But uh, we're going to start, before we get into all of that, with some dragon saga. And actually, before we jump into that, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Spotify Green Room. You can download the app today on your iOS or Android device and join me in a room later this week to talk about this Reds team. Spotify Green Room is changing the way that we talk sports. All right. I want to bring Jeff Gilbert in. He is the man at Dayton Daily News covering the Dragons, and he's been to pretty much every single home game so far this season, so we wanted to get his take on what's going on. First of all, Jeff, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing well, doing well. We had a we got rained out last night, uh, so I got home early. So I got uh, a better night's rest than usual from from that. But uh, doubleheader tonight, they, they do the – just like the majors do now that the majors took that cue for the minors. You get a double header, you play seven innings. And so that's what they're going to do tonight against uh, the great lakes, which is the Dodgers team. Nice. I, I think it's funny. Uh, people are going to call me bias or something. It's two days in a row. I've had a Jeff on the podcast with me, <laughs> um, but with, with the dragons kind of flip flopping from low a to high a, what have you noticed with that this season? Because I know it was something I had talked about with Doug gray that, you know, some guys are going to get promoted and their lockers not even going to move, but what else have you seen going on up there? Uh, it's been a little bit different as we've gotten into the season, I think at the beginning, it felt kind of like the same old kind of base, you know, the same thing that we had seen for years up here, as far as low a level of play. And I remember asking Tom Nichols about that. Tom's the broadcaster for the dragons games uh, radio. And then they do some TV up here too. And he said, ah, oh, it's too early to tell. And I, I kind of agreed with him there. That was about, you know, a couple of weeks into the season. And, uh, uh, but now as we've gone deeper, uh, I, I see uh, there's a little more power hitting. It's not ever really been a home run league, and I don't have the numbers on home runs versus past years. I haven't run those numbers at all. But I think it, it just feels like there's more a little more power. Okay. Uh, when guys hit home runs, they, they hit them farther. Uh, we've seen some out on the street. If anybody's familiar with that stadium out to left field over the concession stand, I've seen three or four up by the scoreboard is like, I don't remember seeing home runs hit like that here before. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that. Uh, I think the pitching is is better. Uh, you see pitchers who are uh, just have more command, uh, less walking. Uh, and you get a game where you get walks, of course. You know you have those, but uh, I, uh, a little more, a little more uh, uh, higher velocity overall. I think on fastballs. And that's because maybe that, you know, that's not just the talent level is a little higher because you've got guys that have got the high A who versus guys who were in low A in the past that maybe never would have gotten high A. But as we've right. seen in baseball recently over recent years, it's like a guy comes to the out of, out of college or high school and his velocity is at one level. And by the time he gets to the majors, he's added five, six, seven, eight miles per hour to his fastball. So I, I think we're seeing that. Those are the two things that – and it's clean. It's cleaner. The, the, uh, defensively, you see cleaner games. Don't have the crazy errors that you saw in years past. What Not, you're as, much. Not as much. Not as much. No, the, the Dragons have 
uh, they've committed – they have fewer errors than games played, which is unusual. And uh, I think they have the fewest their, – their second fewest errors in the league. So It's good to see you seeing that on the MLB side, we, we've definitely had our share of defensive woes. So oh, yeah. hopefully, yeah. hopefully the future's bright with the glove. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think so. Looking at what the dragons. Speaking of futures, right? The the dragons have had a pretty good season, haven't they? Right. They're they're thirty four and twenty five right now. They've reached the halfway point of the season. You know, in years past, the way the minor leagues have operated, they would have a first half championship, and they would have secured a playoff berth. But this year, coming into the season, none of the minor leagues scheduled playoffs. Uh, they shortened the season. The this this level went from one hundred and forty to one hundred and twenty games. Uh, so they shortened it, they took away the playoffs. And then two, three weeks ago, they announced that for a and double a, they are going to have a, a championship series. And so the dragons are in the race for that. Uh, it's the championship series will be a best of five and it'll be the two best records in the league. So there are two divisions. So winning a division doesn't guarantee you anything. It's, okay. it's the two best records in the league. And right now, uh, going into this half, um, and I'm not sure what happened last night with any of the other teams, they had a two-and-a-half game lead on a couple teams in their division, and then there was Cedar Rapids in the West. They were only up on by half a game. And then they're – so the Dragons were overall second in the league going into this half. They're like four-and-a-half games behind Quad Cities. So they're in the mix. Uh, whether they end up in one of those top two spots, certainly there's a whole lot of baseball to play to determine that. But they're in the mix of that. And uh, they've only been to – Dragons have been here since 2020. They've only been to the playoffs like seven times. They've never been to the championship series. So – so that's good to see and uh, for them, and we'll see what happens. So fingers crossed on that yeah. one. Hopefully yeah. they can they can seal the deal. Uh, when we look at the Dragons team, there, there's definitely been some dudes that have gone through, and you kind of mentioned those long home runs. I, was it was it Mario Bautista that hit the one to the street? <coughs> Mar- yeah, he yeah they that was that was insane. Yeah, so the <laughs> the track man guy with the computer like sits a couple seats away from me in a press box, and he's always and you can see his screen and. I don't remember. He was, it was over a hundred miles an hour off the bat and it was an estimated 458 feet. So sort of like what we were seeing in the home run derby the other night. Um, he crushed it. Uh, Brian Ray, who was here for two or th- maybe three weeks uh, and tore the league apart um, and then got moved up to double a, he hit one like up over the scoreboard or off the scoreboard one night. And another guy that night hit one. One of them hit like over the dragon's head on the one side and the other one hit, hit high up off the board that night. So yeah, you're seeing that. And um, so Brian was a tremendous hitter here, uh, moved on up. Um, the hottest hitter on the team right now is a guy named Francisco or Oh yeah. And he is a second baseman He's hitting 335. He's second in the league in hitting. He's been red hot since the end of May. Uh, he didn't hit well at all to start and wasn't even playing every day. Uh, but as soon as he started hitting now, he's he's in the lineup all the time. And uh, he's not on the Reds. He's not on any of those prospect lists, you see. But um, they call him or barrels. Uh, the CJ, Gilman, <laughs> CJ Gilman, who's the Reds minor league hitting coordinator, he hung that nickname on him in, um, in, in spring training. And because he he does he hits the ball hard and he hits it all over the field. He's not a he's had a couple two or three homers. He's not a big power guy, but at this point, but we've seen guys not be big power guys in the minors and then hit a lot of homer. Uh, Jesse Winker, for example. So you know that he, he's really hitting the ball well, and um, and they got three or four other guys that are that show a little bit of promise offensively. Uh, none of them are on the big prospect lists. Uh, the number one hitting prospect out position player prospect on the team is Michael Ciani. And I talked to Michael the other day, he, you know, he had a, a spring UCL in his throwing arm late last season. Um, he had to rehab, rehab, rehab. He was, uh, he didn't get much of spring training. Uh, when he started the season, <clears throat> excuse me, he could only DH. Uh, and as he said, I hate DH cause man, you don't get to think about anything else. You don't get to go out to the field and forget about that at bat you had. You just right. stick with you. So he started to hit lately. Uh, the last game of the on Sunday, he had three hits. So he's feeling like, oh, maybe I can get something going here. He's still – you can tell that he is a – he's rated the best defensive outfielder in the organization, best athlete in the organization. You you, you see that when he's on the field. Um, uh, he just has to come around with the bat, and maybe he will this half. He might have a really good second half. 
I'm glad that we kind of got through those. And I'm definitely, as, as he goes through the farm system, I'm, I'm going to remember Ur Barrels. That, that is a, <laughs> that is a major league nickname. I love yeah. that. Uh, so I'm glad that we got through those guys first, because there is also another category because those are good prospects. There's a category in and of himself because he's created it himself. Graham Ashcraft spent some time in Dayton, and he has been absolutely on fire with any level of the minor leagues that he touches. What did you get to see from him on the mound? What I saw, well, I, I just the most impressive like thing I remember uh, was in June. Uh, one night, one of the nights he pitched because he had three starts in June and didn't give up any runs. You know, and then he went to Chattanooga and had a couple starts in June, didn't give up any runs. So he was like the Reds pitcher of the month, right? right. Well, one of those starts, he came out and like in the first inning, he threw five or six. He hit 99 five or six times. Nice. And, um, you know, and he's a guy who uh, they reportedly hit 100 down in Arizona before they broke camp. And so, uh, he, he, so he's got the power. You know, he's got the fastball. But – he seems like a guy who, who knows how to pitch a little bit. I mean, he's obviously got more to learn, but I think, I think he's a, he's bona fide prospect in terms of a guy that I think is going to get his shot at starting at the big league level at some point. Um, he uh, seems to know how to pitch. Uh, Tyler Malley was a guy that I saw here that I felt like knew how to pitch better than anybody coming up through. And, um, and has has added to his velocity since he since he's moved up, but uh, this guy I don't know that I would say he reminds me of Tyler, but in any way other than that, I, I think when I see him pitch, I think that guy can pitch in the big leagues. And I thought that about Tyler Malley when I saw him pitch here. I thought that guy can pitch in the big leagues. And Santion same way, um, those guys. So he, I think he projects really well. Time will tell, but I think I think he has a good shot. Um, there's a couple. Of, go ahead. I'm looking forward to seeing this dude uh, just progress because I I remember hearing his name in the preseason, but it wasn't something that guys were throwing up there with Ladello or with uh, Hunter Green and no, you no. know uh, obviously so. But at the same point, it, it's awesome to see because it's kind of a testament to what we've been hearing about Kyle Bodie and Derek Johnson getting together and Eric Jagers and those guys putting together the program for development and pitching, which is something that in years past this, this organization just hasn't had. Right. And I think that that's a, a really good point. The question is what is driveline and Kyle Bodie doing for this organization? Right. We want to know right. it's a little too early to tell at the major league level, I think, because the Reds notoriously have not, developed pitchers very well. I mean, we all know that that's not, that's not a news flash. Uh, five years from now, are we going to look back and say, are we going to say, wow, look at all these guys that have come up through our system. And, and this is like, this is like what the Dodgers do or, 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 or the Mets, you know, it's, it's that type of stuff. So, um, you know, uh, I want to get a, I want to get a interview with Brian Garman soon. He's the dragons pitching coach. And I want to talk to him about that, um, and hopefully write something for, for the for uh, for the the paper on that, and um, try to get a sense of where that's going and what and, and what he sees in that. Um, I think I think that's an interesting thing to going forward, and you know, even on this staff, still, you know, we mentioned Ashcraft, but what you know, still here um, is a guy, um, uh, Lion Richardson, who was a high school pick. He's like the Reds. Baseball America's got him as like their 13th prospect. Noah Davis, their 15th prospect. They have not been as sharp as or consistent as uh, Ashcraft was. Um, Richardson's a uh, – they both have talent, and they both have time to develop and, 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 and possibly help this team, help the Reds at some point. Uh, Richardson seems to have a uh, – he seems like a fighter, you know? Right. Uh, they were uh, – <laughs> Always a good thing. They, I was down. Uh, one of my tasks is I have to take pictures at the game and uh, as well as report. So I'm down by the by the visiting dugout where the grounds crew hangs out, and that's it's like a camera well type of place down there. And I'm down there, and Richardson's on the mound last week against uh, West Michigan, which is the Tigers team, and and uh, he steps off the mound a couple times in one inning, and he's being kind of slow and somebody, one of the players from the dugout starts hollering at him, you know, stay on the, you know, quit stepping off, get on, you know, throw the pitch, throw the pitch. 
Um, and uh, they two or three times, and and he took exception to it. He was he was looking over there to see who it was. Uh, he struck, you know, when he I know when he uh, struck the last guy, he struck out the guy that finished the inning, and he he looked over and glared him down. He, you know, he he didn't go Amir Garrett on him or anything, but he, you know, <laughs> he was not he, he was not gonna back down. And so he's right. a guy who is a real competitor um, and has that he has an edge to him. He seems like so. I haven't had a chance to talk with him. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they wouldn't even let us go. In, <clears throat> they haven't let us. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's okay. They uh, we couldn't do player interviews MLB for first half of the season after the games. Um, I was able to do a few before games for some other stories, but post game stuff we weren't allowed to do until this past week. We could get down on the field, and as long as I've been vaccinated and all that kind of stuff, which I have, so then I can get down there and talk to a guy after the game. And and he's not a guy I've had a chance to talk to yet, but you know I figure I, I will at some point. Like I talked to Siani the other day. Um, so those, that's sort of the pitching, the relief pitching. There's a guy named Braxton Roxby who was, uh, pitched at a D2 school in Pennsylvania, did not have good numbers in college. Somehow, you know, they still, he still got picked up by the Reds. He's developed a wicked slider. Um, he struggled a little bit here. He went about his first 15 innings, didn't give up a run. He's a guy to maybe keep an eye on. Another reliever, John Geisel, was here two years ago, saved like 18 or 19 games. He's back down here. I still think he, he can hit high 90s. I think he still is a guy on we should keep on our radar. Um, the other player on this team that I really like is a kid named Jacob Hurtabees, who's an outfielder, if, you, if you've heard of him. Fastest guy in the organization. He's the guy who went to West Point. Um, got, he's uh, deferring his – he's able to – last couple of years they changed the rules. He can defer his um, service time, his five years, until he's done playing baseball. And so he he's a left-handed hitter. He gets on base. He's not a power hitter, uh, but he gets on base. He tends to be in the middle of things a lot. Uh, he's He's been a little hot and cold with the bat, but I think, you know, does he – is he a major league player someday? Uh, I don't know, but he's fun to watch here. I know that. Absolutely. And, you know, he answers that question that Billy Bean always had. Does he get on base? And that's a good thing. Well, he's, hey, over, uh, he's over 400 <laughs> on base. <laughs> he's like 280, but his on base is like 410. So. And nothing wrong with that. I know that, you know, until he got hurt, Yasmani Grandal was on track to make the All-Star game because his on base was just ridiculous and he was hitting lower than 200, but he just got on base all the time. And yeah, that's what you love to see. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I appreciate you coming on, man. I, I know it's been a while. We've been trying to talk about this for a while, so I definitely want to do it again here soon in the season to see where the dragons have gone, but sure. I appreciate you making time for us here. Today. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. He is Jeff Gilbert at Dayton daily news. You can follow what's your handle on Twitter again. Uh, J W underscore Gilbert. And he will be giving you game updates as they happen. The dragons are playing again tonight. Are they at home or on the road? They're at home this week. So the season has been a series of six game series. You know, you're right. You go somewhere for six days or you host somebody for six days. And it's been mostly alternating, but right now they're in a mode where they're doing, they did like two straight weeks on the road. And now this is their second straight week at home. And then they're, they're going to go back to the every other week at home. So there you go. If you're looking for some baseball, you're missing the Reds. You got the Dragons in town tonight and tomorrow before Friday's series with the Brewers gets going. Jeff, I appreciate it again, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. And coming up here, we're going to talk about wrapping up the all-star game and, and, and Jeff, Jesse Winker and Nick Castellanos, what they did. They didn't get any hits, but we're going to reset what's coming up in the second half of the season. That's all coming up here in just a minute. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to let you know that when it comes to dinner, are you stressed? Are you tired? Just don't feel like cooking food that's fast doesn't have to be fast food. Freshly offers quality meals without the hard work of preparing, cooking, and cleaning because Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door, no cooking required. Grocery shopping and cooking can be a pain, especially right now. And with Freshly, you don't have to. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week so you can keep your fridge stocked and skip the trip 
to the store. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose over 30 delicious, satisfying, better-for-you meals like steak peppercorn, sausage-baked penne, or their chicken pesto bowl. Right now, Freshly is offering my listeners $40 off for the first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash locked on. Stop stressing about dinner and go to Freshly.com slash locked on for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash locked on for $40 off your first two orders. And also check out on your smartphone today, whether it be an iOS or an Android, the Spotify Green Room app. Spotify Green Room brings fans together with the conference call that I like to say you actually want to be on because you can join fans, you can join players, you can join writers, broadcasters, all of that good stuff on Spotify Green Room talking about your favorite team or sport, like in this case, the Cincinnati Reds and Major League Baseball. I'll be going live later on this week on the Spotify Green Room app talking about this Reds team as we get set for the second sort of half of the season as they come out of the All-Star break. Check out the Spotify Green Room app, set up your profile, link your Twitter account, and follow me at Jeff Carr with three F. So you can be notified when I go live. You can also follow your favorite teams and sports to see who's going live and talking about all the biggest news on Spotify green room. That's the Spotify green room app changing the way that we talk sports. All right. So we are now moving on here. The, the all-star break is coming to a close. And we've got Jesse Winker and Nick Castellanos coming off this all-star game performance. Neither one got a hit. Jesse Winker did get a walk. I blame the uniforms. They were terrible. I don't understand what Major League Baseball was thinking. Just let the guys wear their own team uniforms. I mean, it's like everybody says back in the day in the all-star game, it was fun to see your favorite players from your favorite teams wearing your favorite uniforms. But then they gave them these I don't even know what to call them. They were just awful. The uniforms that they had to wear last night, the National League with the white ones, the American League with the navy blue ones, and they had the logo superimposed over the abbreviation of the team city. It, it was just, it was garbage. I think they were terrible. I think the same people that designed those weird clip art hats for New Era must have designed these uniforms. They, they were off. Yeah, but enough about the uniforms. Castellanos and Winker didn't quite uh, have the debuts we were hoping for, but they got their name out there. And the National League once again lost. That's the eighth time in a row and the 26th time in my lifetime that the American League has just dominated this all-star game. But I want to look at something different. I want to talk about the... Winker and Castellanos factor for the second half of the season, because most people know those are the guys that make this offense go. And both of them have had phenomenal first half of the seasons, but they both kind of came back down to earth a little bit. Definitely Winker more than Castellanos, because when you look at Castellanos numbers over the last 30 days, those are still pretty good. You can see them up here on the screen, blocking my face. They got a 288 average for Castellanos here in these last 30 games, still hitting six home runs. He still comes up with the big hits. So you're not really that worried about the numbers that have dipped. Everyone is asking the question, though. Should we worry about Jesse Winker? And that is an interesting question because when you look at his last 30 games, I try to back it out to 30 because I feel like that is at least a fair enough sample size, not too small, but fair enough that you can kind of see what's going on. He's at 216. The numbers are really small on my screen. 216 in those last 30 games. And the OPS of less than 700 is a lot less than you want to see. The uh, irony of all of this is when you talk about how he has struggled in those 30 games, he is still batting over 300. That's how good he was in the opening month, two months of the season. So I think that this is just a blip one of the ebbs and flows of the season that is 162 games. And I think it's something that they're going to get back. Winker is not the crazy 400 average that he was basically hitting for the first month and a half, but he's also not this 216 batting average that he has right now. He's somewhere in between, and that's going to be plenty fine to continue his amount of production for this lineup. I'm, I'm not worried about Jesse Winker. I know that there's some people that are trying to put him in the same vein of like, oh, we're worried about a Eugenio Suarez and we're worried about Jesse Winker. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
two totally different scenarios there. I am a lot more worried about a Eugenio Suarez than I am about Jesse Winker. Those guys, Winker and Castellanos are still going to be the anchors in the middle of this lineup. And I think that that's going to continue all season long. And I wanted to talk about that just briefly because we've got something else to get into. We've got a detractor in the comments talking about the Reds are lame. Yeah, we're going to get into that here in just a minute. Before we get into that, though, I want to let you know that you can take a snack break with Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market, bar none pun intended there. It's made with 100% real chocolate and the nutrition facts are amazing. The stats don't lie. Less than four grams of carbs, less than four grams of pro or uh, sugar and up to 17 or 18 grams of protein, more protein than you expect from a candy bar tasting protein bar. They've got a awesome flavors. They got coconut that tastes like a mountains bar. They've got my favorite cherry bar Sia, which is just a party in your mouth. Check it out today at builtbar.com and use the promo code locked 15 to save 15% off your next order from builtbar.com. That's builtbar.com and the promo code locked 15. All right. One more thing I want to get to today. It's, uh, this, uh, comment, And it's interesting to note because detractors are going to happen when you're good. So if you saw this comment uh, coming here from Anthony, uh, and and it's in response to a couple of podcasts ago, the title of the podcast was the Cincinnati Reds are good. Anthony Long doesn't think so. He thinks they're lame. The Reds are lame team who rely on one of the smallest parks in the league to get home runs, and they're carried by two players and have a friendly schedule. They are a team that nobody likes because of their attitude. First of all, to Anthony, I want to say this. Thank you, because it's a good sign. The Reds are good enough to get other fans mad. You're not talking about a team that you don't like if they're good. In fact, uh, they haven't got these kind of comments in a few years. Maybe they got some of them last year whenever they were on the run, making their playoff run. But this is a clear indication that the Reds are in the thick of it. So thank you, Anthony. As for the source, eh, maybe he's a Cardinals fan. Maybe this is actually the burner for Lucas Smith. I'm just kidding. Shout out to my buddy who hosts the Locked On Cardinals podcast. But all kidding aside, let's let's break this down. The Reds do have more home runs at home. They got 68 compared to 45 on the road. They do score more runs at home, 238 compared to 197. And they are the second best team when you talk about run differential in games played at home, as opposed to on the road, they score 1.34 runs per game more when they play at great American ballpark. They play 82 games there or 81 games there. So I, I would hope that they were better at home. And when you look at this, they are 20th in major league baseball. This is the interesting part, because if you read that comment, he says, uh, smallest parks in the league to get home runs. It's implying that they have to get home runs to score any kind of runs. They're actually 20th in major league baseball. When it comes to percentage of runs scored off homers at 40.9, remember last year, whenever everyone was talking about if the reds don't hit a home run, they're not going to score because it was over 60% of their runs were scored off of homers. That's completely flip-flopped. In fact, they're kind of good at scoring runs outside of homers. And when you look at the list, there are some notable teams that score more runs off of home runs, like the Padres and Brewers at 41.6%, the Mets at 42.8%, the Dodgers at 42.9%, the Cardinals, assuming this guy is a Cardinals fan because, well, Cardinals fans are probably all like, "Mm, stupid Reds. But the Cardinals score 43.3% of their runs off homers. The Cubs at 44.2. And the team in Major League Baseball most reliant on home runs to score a run, the San Francisco Giants at 51.7. So to say that they need home runs, they don't really need them. It helps. Everybody loves the long ball. Chicks dig the long ball. What? Who's crapping on home runs anyway? But hey, we can even argue against that. 
Plus, let's look at something else. The Reds are fourth in the National League with a 257 average with runners in scoring position, and they're fourth in Major League Baseball in team on base percentage. So to tell me that they're relying on two guys in their lineup to score runs and they're relying on playing at home to hit home runs to score runs is absolutely backwards. And Anthony, thank you for your comment and just confirming the fact that the Reds are once again relevant. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching and listening to the Locked On Reds podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Carr. Make sure that you follow the podcast on your favorite podcasting app or you uh, subscribe right here on Twitter. You can also follow me on, or you follow the, you subscribe to the podcast right here on YouTube. You follow me on Twitter at Jeff Carr with three Fs and follow the show at Locked On Reds and save the Locked On Reds line number into your phone at 513-549-0159 for comments, questions, reactions, whatever you've got, lay them on me there in the Locked On Reds line. But that's going to do it for us here today. Now, tell your smart device to go play the Locked On MLB Prospects podcast. Aram Layton hosts and takes a look at farm systems around the major leagues and gives you updates each and every day. I'm sure he's going to be talking a lot about this draft that just happened and how it affects teams around the league. Check it out, the Locked On MLB Prospects podcast. But for the Locked On Reds podcast today, and thanks again to Jeff Gilbert for joining in, I'm your host, Jeff Carr. I will talk to each and every one of you tomorrow. And I've forgotten to promo what's coming up tomorrow. We're going to have Rob Wooten from the Chattanooga Lookouts on to talk about the lookouts and we'll ask him about this pitching development here in the reds farm system that's coming up tomorrow on the lockdown reds podcast make sure you join me